everyone. My name is Daniel Skelton, and I am the pastor at Dogwood Prairie United Methodist Church, as well as Seed at Chapel United Methodist Church in Oblong, Illinois. And it's an honor and a blessing to be able to share the Word of God with you wherever you are and whatever you happen to be doing. I want to thank you for taking the time to tune in and to join me again wherever you are and whatever you happen to be doing. And, and as you join, I encourage you to just remind yourself of this, that the Word of God is not meant just for a particular day of the week. It's not meant to be put in a box, put underneath your bed, or put on a shelf, or put in a photo, photo album and, and only taken out or looked at whenever you need it. Rather, the Word of God is meant for every day of your life. It's meant for Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and back to Sunday. It's meant for every day of the week, every week of the month, every month of the year, and every year of your life. So you have access to God whenever and wherever you need Him. You have the freedom to do that. Don't just wait for that particular day during the week when you need Him, but every day, every day search for Him, pray for Him, ask that He be in your life. Because every day he's giving you that opportunity to get to know him a little bit more. To experience his love, his blessed assurance, and his amazing grace. So, remember that this week as you go about doing what, what you have on your agenda and what God is calling you to do. Remember that the word of God is not just a one day thing. It is a lifelong experience that nurtures us, strengthens us, and comforts us as we become a better disciple today than what we were yesterday. So thank you for tuning in and for joining me for this week's message. Speaking of this week's message, we begin a new sermon series titled The Book of Jonah, The Saved Castaway. You've got that right. We're going to be looking at Jonah. We're going to be reminded through Jonah of, of different moments in our life when we act like Jonah. Believe it or not, we could be called Jonah ourselves. We've all run away from God. We've all questioned God. We've all sacrificed our life maybe for others we've all done the things in which Jonah has done and, and through the book of Jonah we're going to be reminded that that even though we may flee from God even though we may choose to run from God God will never flee from us and I think that's a powerful message for us to realize and to experience and embody as disciples and as followers of Christ is that even though we may choose our own path God is still going to be there. He's going to meet us where we're going because he knows where we're going. So no matter if we run from God or not, God will never flee from us. And that's going to be a powerful message that we look at as we journey with, as we swim with Jonah over these next few weeks. So I hope you're ready for that. I hope you're excited to learn more about the book of Jonah, Jonah himself, and about how Jonah applies to our everyday life. If you have a Bible nearby, I invite you to go ahead and grab that Bible. We're not going to read the scripture right away. We're going to read it on later on in this message. But I invite you to go ahead and grab your Bible, open it up to the book of Jonah. And the book of Jonah falls after the book of Obadiah. And Obadiah is the shortest book in the Old Testament, only 21 verses. So Jonah is comes after Obadiah and right before Micah in the Old Testament. And we're going to learn a little bit historically about Jonah and the book of Jonah here in a little bit, but I invite you to go ahead and open your Bible to the book of Jonah, and we'll be reading verses 1 through 16 um, as we get going here. So I hope you're able to, you'll have plenty of time to find your Bible, um, but I encourage you to go ahead and grab that now and to open it up to Jonah, to the book of Jonah, chapter 1. A boy came late to Sunday school. Knowing he was usually very prompt, his teacher said, Johnny, is there anything wrong? No, ma'am, not really. He said, I was going to go fishing, but my daddy told me that I needed to get on up and go to church. The teacher was very impressed and asked Johnny if his father had explained to him why it was more important to go to church than to go fishing. Yes, ma'am, he did. Johnny said, my dad said he didn't have enough bait for the two of us. No matter what we have planned, no matter what we want to do, and no matter where we are, God has a way to reel us 
into his plans. He needs us. And he needs us to go to places that he needs us to go. But how many times have you decided to go fishing rather than committing yourself to the works of the Lord? Some of you may be able to count all those times simply by using your fingers. Others may have to take off their shoes and socks in addition to using their fingers. And and still others will, will take off their shoes and socks, nudge their neighbor to do the same as they can so that they can keep counting. They, they have their fingers, they have their toes, and they need a little bit more assistance to count all the times that they've run or walked away from God. No matter how perfect you may want to be, you may have chosen your own ways before choosing the ways of the Lord. In 1994... Paramount Pictures released a film based upon a book published in 1986 by Winston Groom, which focuses on a young man retelling his adventures as he sat on a public bench waiting for a bus to arrive. His adventures range from shrimp boating and ping pong championships to to thinking about his childhood love, Jenny, to his time fighting in Vietnam under the military command of Lieutenant Dan, all while finding a way to relate life to a box of chocolates. I bet you know what movie I'm talking about. Forrest Gump, starring Tom Hanks, is a film that gives us plenty to think about and and ponder as we contemplate the adventures and stories that we want to retell about our own life. And maybe we're still trying to figure out how that box of chocolates represents life. We may not be able to relate to every story told by Forrest Gump, but there is one story that we can certainly relate to. When conversing with Jenny at a young age out in front of his house, Forrest is made fun of by a group of bullies. Rocks and dried mud are thrown at him and insults are hurled his way. In an act of desperation, Jenny tells Forrest to run, run, Forrest, run. Now, Forrest had a tough time walking, let alone running, because of his leg braces. He, but he listened to Jenny. As much as he wanted to stay with her, he decided to run. Let me say that again. As much as Forrest wanted to stay with Jenny, following his own plans, he decided to run. He decided to run even though it wasn't what he initially wanted to do, right? He wanted to stay there. If you've ever seen the movie, you'll notice that he stays there and takes the mud that's being thrown at him and the insults at him. He doesn't budge. He just stands next to Jenny. Like I said earlier, we might not be able to relate to every story told by Forrest Gump, but running, running away from what truly matters and doing something that scares us, those things that we can relate, those are the things we can relate to because we've been there. Because we've been there. If you put yourselves in Forrest's shoes, right? He felt comfortable staying where he was because he knew what he was capable of doing and not capable of doing. Walking and running were an issue for him. But yet he listened to someone in his life. He did something he was uncomfortable with and he decided to run. If you don't want to call yourself a Forrest Gump, then maybe calling yourself Jonah is more fitting. Jonah is just one of many characters in the Old Testament that ran, ran from God, so to speak. Moses ran from God. Jacob wrestled with God. Jacob wrestled with God. Sarah, the wife of Abraham, laughed at God when she found out that she was pregnant at her old age and Noah couldn't fathom building an ark. Many people, many prophets... Many faithful believers in which we look up to on a daily basis have run from God because they were told to do something that they didn't feel comfortable doing. And Jonah, in my opinion, is the best runner of them all because he teaches us a valuable lesson. Just because we decide to run, it doesn't mean that God won't chase after us. We can run from God, but we cannot flee from God. 
We can run from God, but we cannot flee from God. For the next couple of weeks, we are going to be running with Jonah. As we run with Jonah, or rather swim with Jonah, I should say, we are going to be reminded that sometimes in life, running is not always the best answer. Staying true to God's call and plan is what will get us safely to the other side. We begin our adventure by being reminded of three things from chapter one of the book of Jonah. First, God's call to Jonah. Second, Jonah's commission and attempt to flee. And third, one cannot flee from God. So at this time, if you have your Bible nearby, I invite you to go ahead and turn to Jonah chapter one as we read verses 1 through 16. I'll be reading from the NRSV translation of the Bible. Verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish, and from the presence of the Lord, he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish, So he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and such a mighty storm came upon the sea that the ship threatened to break break up. Then the sailors were afraid, and each cried to his God. They threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it from them. Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down into the hold of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. The captain came and said to him, what, what are you doing sound asleep? Get up, get up, call on your God. Perhaps the God will spare us. They thought that we do not perish. The sailors said to one another, come, let us cast lots so that we may know on whose account this calamity has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And what, uh, and of what people are you? I am a Hebrew, he replied. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and dry land. Then the men were even more afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them so. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea was growing more and more temptuous. He said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it because of me that this great storm has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring the ship back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more stormy against them. Then then they cried out to the Lord, Please, please, O Lord, we pray, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not make us guilty of innocent blood for you. O Lord, have, have done as it is pleased with you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea. And the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord even more, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. This is the word of God for the people of God, and all God's people said, Thanks be to God. The book of Jonah, a story about a prophet attempting to run away from the Lord, is the fifth major collection of writings in the Minor Prophets found in the Old Testament. The placement of Jonah after Amos and Obadiah, two books containing prophecies concerning foreign nations, coincides well with Amos and Obadiah since Jonah offers another prophecy concerning foreigners, the people of Nineveh. Scholars have estimated that the book of Jonah was written no later than the 3rd century before Christ. Some scholars have made the argument that Jonah, son of Amittai, is mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 14 as as a prophet who prophesied in the northern kingdom of Israel in the days of of the king Jeroboam II in the mid-8th century before Christ. 
There has not been a lot of information gathered on the person of Jonah, but few things may help you paint a picture. But a few of these things may help you paint a picture of this humorous, misguided prophet as he leads us to repentance and restoration. So let's dive into the text. Our first thing that we want to take note of is God's first call to Jonah. God's commission to Jonah. Now, we're going to stop right there. If people know anything about Jonah, besides what I've shared with you already, they know it's, it's got something to do with Jonah telling God no about going to Nineveh and then being swallowed up by a big fish. Some stories say it was a whale of a fish, right? A huge fish. And a lot of people get hung up right there and say, this can't be true. How, how is that even possible? Staying alive in a fish for three days? It's got to be a myth. There's no way this is a true story. People get hung up on that and they forget to look at the greater picture of what Jonah is trying to tell us throughout the whole book, let alone in chapter 1. Well, I would remind you that this is not a story about a big magical fish. It's a story about God and how God calls upon certain people to share the word. The book of Jonah begins. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Emmetai. For starters, we are told that Jonah is the son of Emmetai. Emmetai is only mentioned twice in the Bible. In 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25, and Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. Nothing is known about him other than the fact that he is Jonah's father. By mentioning the father, Jonah or some unknown author is providing some level of respect to the family lineage. Next, we are told that the word of the Lord came to Jonah. The word of the Lord, the word of God, or the word of Yahweh is is sacred, reverent, and truthful. Jonah is not just receiving some common message. Rather, Jonah is receiving a divine message, a, a divine vision, a divine oracle that is going to need to be shared with the people, not held in, but shared to proclaim with all the people. From this word, Jonah has been called to do the work of the Lord. God calling Jonah is our reminder that God can call us. God can give us the word. And as as a matter of fact, he already has done so. God can tell us where to go, what to see, what to do. The word of the Lord can come upon us right now, tomorrow, a few days from now. The word of the Lord is its own thing. However, we must keep in mind that there is no time frame with God. When God gives us the word, we must be ready to share the word and do what he is calling us to do. Like the shepherds in the fields watching their flock by night, we must go with haste to share the good news. Right When the word of the Lord comes upon us, that's, there's something speci- uh, specific, particular about why that's coming to us right now at that particular moment in time. Right? We must not hold it in, but we must share it. We must pray about it. We must say, you know what? The word of the Lord is upon me. Let me do what the word of the Lord is calling me to do. We must not hesitate when we are commissioned by God. So the first lesson that we learn from Jonah in his first commission is that when the, Lord, when the word of the Lord comes upon us, we must act on it. We must not be afraid, but we must cherish it, embody it, experience, and embrace it. Second, Jonah's commission and attempt to to flee. Jonah continues, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Emmetai, saying, go at once to Nineveh, the great, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1 through 2. Two things about Nineveh. First, it was very great, and second, very wicked. Nineveh was huge. Jonah says, Jonah says it took three days to walk from one side of the metroplex to the other. Historians tell us that that the walls of Nineveh were so huge, so big, they were big enough to ride three chariots across. Nineveh is a huge place. Second, as I said earlier, Nineveh was extremely wicked. The Ninevites were known as some of the cruelest people in the ancient world. Nineveh boasted in their own histories about how cruel they were. When they, when they would conquer another city, they would skin alive a lot of the men, women, and children and, and spread out their skins over the city walls. Then they would bury these skinned people while they were still alive up to their heads in the sand. 
and pull their tongues out and drive a stake through their tongue into the ground. So they would just languish in pain and dying of thirst. These were the people that Jonah was asked to go and preach to. And so naturally, Jonah doesn't want to go. Can you blame him after hearing what these people of Nineveh would like to do to the people? Would you want to preach to people that were so wicked that they hunger for death, abuse, and cruelty? They chose pain rather than peace. They seek power rather than liberty and justice for all. They believe killing the outsider is the solution to any problem. It's no wonder why Jonah said, no way, I'm not going over there. Have you seen what they could do to me if I go over there? I'm out of here. Leave me alone. I'm not going to see these people. Can you blame Jonah for saying no? Many of us would say no if we were called to go to Nineveh during this time because we knew, we heard through the grapevine of what they did to people that weren't like them. It's no wonder Jonah said no. But if you think about it, God was leading Jonah to the very people who Jesus in the gospel of Luke seeks out. It states in Luke chapter 4 verse 18, he, Jesus, he, he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed. We are Jonah's. Wanting to flee, but are committed to the word of the Lord to proclaim, release, recover, and set free. Even though we may want to say no, the word of the Lord has already come upon us and is directing us where God needs us to go. The text continues in verse 3. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish. From the presence of the Lord, he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Here begins Jonah's rebellion against God, right? His attempt to flee. God clearly told him to go, and he ran the other way. And not a little ways, Tarshish was 2,500 miles from Nineveh. 2,500 miles from Nineveh. That's equivalent to traveling from the east coast to the west coast of the United States, depending on what route you take. Jonah just didn't flee to his neighbors or to the nearest town. No, no way. Jonah fled from 550 miles northeast of Israel to the present day east coast of Spain. 2,500 miles. Jonah said, hey, I'm not just going to go to the next town. I'm going as far away as I can from these people in which God wants me to go to. Jonah was trying his best to get away from God. By fleeing for Tarshish, Jonah was basically saying, no way, Jose, to God. But Jonah didn't realize what we realize today. We might create distance between us and God, but there was no distance between God and us. From this verse, I offer you this. You're never farther from God than when you're close to him and say no. You're never farther from God than when, you, when you're close to him and say no. There are a lot of godly people who look like they are walking with God in, in every other way. But there's some area they are saying no to him in. Maybe for you, it's a relationship that you know is not pleasing to God, but you won't quit. So you say no when God says you got to leave this relationship. Maybe there is a sacrifice God has put on your heart to make, but you haven't committed yourself to it because you keep saying no. Maybe, you, maybe a sin you need to confess, but you won't confess it. You just keep saying no. Maybe a sacrifice of your time he's leading you to meet, make, but you keep saying no. You're never farther from God than when you're close to him and say no. We've all been there. We've all come up with some excuse to say, to say no to God with. We've all been there. Whether you realize it or not, you possibly do it on a daily basis. We say no to God more often than we say yes to him. The other thing to notice in this verse is this. Jonah found a ship ready. Let me tell you something. If you want to run from God, 
there will always be a ship ready to Tarshish. You have an enemy whose whole role is to ready the ship for your disobedience. There's always a ship ready for you to, to run away from God. But the question becomes, are you wanting to board the ship and flee? Or are you wanting to stay close to God and trust him? We are commissioned by God to do God's work, to not say no to him, but to say yes to him. And although we may attempt to flee, God will still find us. God will still find a way to be with us. The problem with running from God is that God already knows where we're going. So there's no point of running. He already knows where we're going. So stop saying no. Stop running and say yes and present yourself before God. I know it's going to be tough. I know it's going to be uncomfortable. But nobody said following God or following the words of Jesus Christ was going to be a piece of cake. But we must be willing to say yes. We must be willing to follow God. So Jonah attempted to flee. But he never totally fled from God because God was with him. So the third and final thing to think about is one cannot flee from God. The next portion of chapter 1, verses verses 4 through 16, remind us that we cannot flee from God. Verses 4 through 5 state, But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and such a mighty storm came upon the sea that the ship threatened to break up. Then the sailors were afraid, and each cried to his God. They threw the cargo that was on the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down into the hold of the ship. And had laid down and was fast asleep. So here's the situation. All these pagan sailors, scared out of their minds, throwing cargo overboard, seeking to stay afloat, are like, everybody pray to their God. Everybody pray to their God. And hopefully one of them will pick up and be in a good mood and then we'll be okay. Everybody just pray to their God that we get through this. And their desperate plea for help, Jonah decides to go into the inner part of the ship and take a nap. Wasn't wasn't Jesus asleep in a boat during a storm as well? In a time of need, sometimes the help we seek is already in the boat with us. Then the captain came and said to him, What are you doing? Sound asleep. Get up. Call on your God. Perhaps the God will spare us a thought so that we do not perish. The sailors said to one another, come and let us cast lots so that we may know on whose accounts this calamity has come upon us. So they cast lots and and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And what people are you? I am a Hebrew, he replied. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were even more afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them so. Jonah chapter 1 verses 6 through 10. This portion of our text provides us with the following realization. God sends storms to break his people from self-reliance. God sends storms into your life to get your attention. Although we may not always agree with the storms, the battles, the temptations, the trials, the tribulations, the valleys, the doubt, the fear, the disappointment, and the anger in our life. God does promise us that those who believe in him may not perish but have eternal life. Even though the storms in our life, the people in our life are are storms that we do not want to face. If we remain close to God instead of fleeing from God. We will not perish. We will not have to be thrown overboard. The storms will become calm and the waves will diminish. Even the sailors knew that belief in God will cause them not to perish. If Jonah had continued to fight the storm, it would have killed him and all aboard. But but when he submitted to the storm and said, throw me into it, it led to his salvation. If you fight it, it will destroy you. If you submit to it, It will save you. So, if you're in something you suspect might be a storm from him, from God, just ask him. He'll make it clear. Don't flee, but believe. 
In an act of desperation, the sailors continued to strive for a solution. Then they said to Jonah, what, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea was growing more and more temptuous. He said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great storm has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring the ship back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more stormy against them. Jonah chapter 1, verses 11 through 13. I just have to say kudos to the pagan sailors. If you read this text carefully, you'll notice that at least they don't want Jonah to die. They don't initially throw him overboard. But now they are rowing in contest against God. How would you like that? How would you like that? You're rowing and and God has his finger on the stern. The harder we fight God, the worse it gets, right? We do all this work. We're fighting against God, but nothing is happening. Think of it this way. The harder you strive to get out of quicksand, the quicker you become immersed in it. There are moments in life that we wish to go against God, to flee from God because we don't like what he is telling us or wanting us to do. So we decide to row upstream instead of, instead of with the current of God. We, we, we strive to get out of this quicksand all on our own. We seek to fight rather than relax and trust the situation. In life, we must learn to listen and follow God's lead rather than pushing back and always striving to do things on our own. With God, everything is possible. But without God, the possible becomes impossible. We sink further and further and further down in the quicksand. We work harder and harder against the current, but find that we're not going anywhere besides going backwards. When we trust in God, and choose not to flee, we submit to what the sailors realized. Then the men feared the Lord even more, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. After picking up Jonah and throwing him into the sea and witnessing the sea, seizing from its rage, the men believed. The men believed. God did not create us to run from him. Instead, God created us to run toward him and to believe in him. Drawing back to the story of Forrest Gump, when Jenny said, run, Forrest, run. Forrest ran knowing that it was not what he wanted to do. He wanted to stay. Jonah wanted to flee. His leg braces slowed him down. He couldn't bend his knees, and there was no way he should have been able to outrun those three bullies who were pedaling behind him. But he ran. He listened to someone who believed in him. As Forrest ran, his leg braces began to break. His knees were able to bend and he he picked up enough speed to outrun the bullies pedaling behind him. It's truly astonishing to witness that that we are capable, what we are capable of doing when we devote ourselves to the voice or voices that believe in us. The time has come to not be a Jonah but to be who God is calling you to be. The time has come to accept the word of the Lord that has come to you. Don't ignore it, but do something about it. Don't put it on a shelf, but carry it with you. And don't wait to act on it, but act now. Remember what Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but your will be done. The Lord has commissioned you. So don't ignore it. Don't ignore his will. We have become a society that likes to sit And listen. However, God needs a people that will listen and do even what He needs to do, even to listen and do, even if what needs to be done is challenging, confusing, and uncomfortable. We are commissioned, we are called, we are we are set aside to do His will on earth as it is in heaven. The time has come to stop saying no to God. The time has come to stop running from God. The time has come to realize that the storms in your life are not there as a payback for your sin, but to bring you back from your sin. Jesus was paid back for your sin. Jesus sacrificed his life so that we would be forgiven and experience salvation. He paid our debt. Jesus went into the storm of God's wrath for you and took it all. 
That means God's wrath is no longer in the storm. Only his love exists. The storm is not designed for retribution. It's designed for restoration. Instead of continuing to fight, why not get down on your knees right now and surrender to God? Surrender all to him. Stop saying no. Instead, say yes. Lastly, I ask you this question. Why do you keep running? God only wants to bless your life and, and to use you more greatly than you, than you ever dreamed. So why are you resisting him? You can run, but you cannot flee from God. The time has come to stop running from God. The time has come to run towards God. The time has come to stop running from God. The time has come to run towards God. As you think about the opening chapter to the book of Jonah, I challenge you this week to pay attention to what God is calling you to do. Don't run from him, but run towards him. Put his voice into action. Write down what he is telling you. Pray what he is telling you. Search scripture for guidance. God is always telling you to do something and he does not, and he does so not to ignore you, but because he knows what you are capable of and what you are capable of is what this world needs to experience so that he can stop running and start believing. What would your life look like if you did more listening and accepting rather than running? What would your life look like if you truly accepted the word of God in your life? What would your life look like if you truly believed in what you have been commissioned to do and stopped attempting to flee from God? What would your life look like if you really realized that you can never flee from the presence of God? Jonah chapter 1 opens up our life for re-examination. But it's up for us to take that part and to re-examine our life and to say, I'm tired of running. I'm ready to do what God has called me to do. Let it be so. Let us pray. Dear gracious God, we hear you today. We heard you yesterday, but we ran away from you. We hear you today, but we don't believe in ourselves to do what you are calling us to do. Oh, Lord, help us to believe in you. Help us to trust in you and help us to run towards you. Lord, we can be Jonah's at times, but more than anything, we want to be who you have called us to be. We are tired of running. We are ready to do your will on earth as it is in heaven. All honor and glory is yours now and forever. Amen. For the sermon takeaway, it's not very long. It's a simple sentence. And I hope this sentence really challenges you, but at the same time motivates you to really think about yourself and to think about what God has called you to do, but yet you've ignored those things. And the sentence is, don't run from God. Instead, run towards God. Don't run from God. Instead, run towards God. You can never flee from God's presence because God already knows where you're going. So stop running. Stop saying no. Give yourself to God and start saying yes. You might be surprised at where that leads you in life when you choose to say yes to him. But the choice is yours. Do you want to run from God or do you want to run toward God? You can run, but you cannot flee from God. Listen to him this week and allow him to change your life. May you be blessed as you overcome the storms in your life and as you trust him more each and every day. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, go out into the world, world knowing that you have been commissioned by God to make a change in this world, that you have been called to stop saying no and to say yes, and that you have been called to run towards God instead of away from him. May God bless you and may God's love and light shine down upon you today and every day. And all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. May God love you. May God's love and light shine down upon you. And may God cherish you each and every day as you continue to say yes to him 
and as you continue to run towards him. And as you continue to see the storms in your life, not as, not as retribution, but as a moment of restoration. May God bless you and keep you until we meet again.